think we will get started. I want to wish everyone a good evening. My name is Judy Margles. I'm the director at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I welcome you to tonight's program, Resisting Cultural Erasure in America. This is the first in a series of programs that we're calling Rising Up for Human Dignity. And all of these programs are in observance of Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month, which takes place in April. We're so pleased that Jennifer Fang and Barrett Holmes Pittner are with us this evening. We're also just delighted to be part of an amazing group of sponsors for this series, including, I'm going to name them all, Never Again Coalition, Oregon Historical Society, Portland State University's Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project, World Oregon, The Immigrant Story, Japanese American Museum of Oregon, Portland Chinatown Museum, Bible Museum, Native Arts and Culture Foundation, Kol Shalom Community for Humanistic Judaism, Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, U.S. Campaign for Burma, and we're also welcoming the support of Rabbi Eve Posen. So thank you so much to all of our sponsors for this evening. Throughout April, the series of events examines attempts at cultural erasure and the ways that communities have resisted and continue to resist these attempts. When we think about genocide, we, think, we typically think about the killing of a group of people. I imagine that you, like me, were just completely absorbed with the news from Ukraine and especially the more recent. Tonight, we're going to look at the topic through a different lens, that being the destruction of a community's culture. And especially with a conversation such as this, we believe it's important that we take a moment to pay respect and honor the work of Indigenous nations, leaders, and families, and to their knowledge, creativity, resilience, and resistance in the face of attempted erasure. We acknowledge the systematic policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that continue to affect Indigenous communities today. We know that resisting these policies and unacceptable behaviors requires occupiers of this land, including ourselves, to listen and amplify Indigenous voices while acknowledging our own complicity in the harm that these histories cause. Our goal is that this series will spark conversation and further learning that leads to informed action and plays a role in fostering a culture of respect, truth, and accountability in our community. One that encourages cultures to not just survive, but to truly thrive. We're just very, very excited and grateful that we have two speakers with us tonight who bring extensive expertise on this subject. And I'm just going to um, introduce both of them to you and then we'll turn the program over. Jennifer Fang is the Director of Interpretation and Community Engagement at Pittock Mansion and is an adjunct professor of history at the University of Portland. She earned a PhD in US history from the University of Delaware with a specialization in race and immigration during the Cold War. She was a founding staff member of the Portland Chinatown Museum and served as the director of education at the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. Along with Chelsea Rose, she guest co-edited the winter 2021 issue of the Oregon Historical Quarterly about Oregon's early Chinese diaspora, which also included an article that she wrote Erasure and Reclamation, Centering Diasporic Chinese Populations in Oregon History. Barrett Holmes Pittner is the founder and philosopher in chief of the Sustainable Culture Lab. He's a contributing writer for the Daily Beast and the BBC, and a lecturer at the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. His book, The Crime Without a Name, Ethnocide and the Erasure of Culture in America, was released last year and named by NPR as one of the top books of the year. He holds a master's degree in journalism from Northwestern University. And I understand that Barrett and Jennifer were uh, roommates at one time. So I think there's a story there, not sure if we'll get to it this evening. My colleague from World Oregon, Tim DeRoche is going to facilitate your questions. I think we all know the drill by now, post your questions in the Q&A tab. Once again, thank you to everyone for joining us and I will turn the program to Jennifer and Barrett. Thank you, Judy. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, it's an honor to be here to have this conversation with Barrett. Um, 
I'd like to thank the Never Again Coalition, um, Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, World Oregon, Oregon Historical Society, and all of the many, many partners who have helped to um, support this event and the other events related to this one this month. Um, so I think Barrett, should we just get get to it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Cool. Um, okay. So Barrett, uh, your you know your book, uh, which is just so it's it's such a great read. It's so interesting. It's just like I mean, it's like mind opening and thought provoking. It's all the things. Um, so your book makes this case that um, that Americans need to develop a language that can better describe the society they live in. So I thought that we could maybe start the conversation today by asking you to talk about just some of the problems that you identify in this book. And um, with these problems that you outlined, how does language offer a solution? Yeah, great question. So, um, so yeah, the, the, the premise of the book in many ways is this word ethnocide. And ethnocide means the erasure of culture while keeping the people. And it's a word that is, hasn't been around for that long. It was actually coined in 1944 by Raphael Lemkin. And Lemkin is also the person who invented the word genocide. He was uh, a Polish Jewish um, refugee. Uh, he fled the Nazis and came to America when he was trying to tell the American government and military officials what was going on to his people. They just didn't believe that this could happen. You know, like Germany was the cultural center of Europe. They just didn't think that Germans could do such a thing. And there wasn't a word to describe it. And so no matter how many times he tried to articulate what was happening, it just wasn't clicking. So he realized he needed to create a new word. And that word was genocide. And then from there, you know, this whole new world opened up in people's minds of like the type of destruction that can happen. And, you know, there's whole organizations across the world that exist now to combat genocide, which prior to 1944 was not even a word that people imagined or in the what, you know, so it words can drastically shape how people see the world and also how they see their society and see what human beings are capable of doing. And so ethnocide, I feel, has that same potential. But the thing that makes it different in like an American context to, to genocide, to a certain extent, is ethnocide is what occurred throughout the transatlantic slave trade. The goal of the slave trade was to get African people, destroy African culture, you know, not let African people, you know, their names were changed, religions were, were destroyed, languages were destroyed, everything that was African was intentionally destroyed to create, ideally, you know, in this negative sense of ideally, uh, a, a people that could be oppressed in perpetuity for the, the, so that colonizers could obtain, you know, wealth or whatever. And so when you look at this in the context of the United States, this is a foundational idea for the formation of the nation, you know, at, you know, I, you know, technically like not technically after, but, you know, genocide of indigenous people was like first, and then the nation that was built upon that genocidal erasure would be one where ethnocide was at the core. And so if you're American and you live in the United States and there's an, a concept, a way of life that has been part of America since the beginning and there has never been a word for it, that's really gonna dramatically impede your capacity to understand and articulate the place in which you live. And so the book kind of starts with that, where if you don't have a word to describe a root concept of the place in which you live, there's a really good chance that you're gonna need a, a new vocabulary and, and new ideas to adequately describe the things that you see and that you experience within the place that you live. That's great. Um, so, you know, in this, in this focus on language and um, like the shortcomings of American English to accurately describe and combat, you know, American society's racist frameworks, you introduced a number of really useful terms. I mean, ethnocide obviously being one of them. Um, could you go over some of 
these like terms that kind of anchor every every the chapters and the overall narrative? Yeah, I can just we just rattle through a bunch of, or is there through, one term that you thought was like the best? Well, so I mean, ethnocide, obviously, but also I think you know you you ground a lot of what you say, a lot of what you're arguing in this like you know this existential like ex uh, essence versus yep. existence. You talk about good faith, bad faith. Um, mm -hmm. You know these are all things that I think you know as I was reading, I was just like. Oh okay, I get this. Like, I, I mean, I've, it's like, I read those works in college and it just kind of went way over yeah. my head. And then reading this book and seeing it applied in an American historical context, and then hearing the way that you, um, you know, talk about your lived experiences in relation to these terms. It's just, it was, um, it just really, it was like, oh, okay. So that's perfect. Okay. I'll, I can rattle through a bunch of go, go, go quick or not too quick, but, uh, Essentially, the theory is if by when I had ethnocide and I that's that I recognize that there's a good chance we just don't have the words to describe what we need to say. And that's how I kind of came up with the word ethnocide. Like Lemkin coined it in 1944, but I found out that he coined it in 1944 after I constructed it myself and then did the research to find if that word was new or it already existed. Because for me as an American, I always viewed our problems more as a cultural problem and not a racial one. Like I grew up in the South, I was around a bunch of white kids growing up. And so I knew that these people weren't like born racist. I knew there was a place in which they live that encouraged them to become racist. And so that's clearly a cultural problem, not a racial problem. And so that's why I focus on culture. Um, so once I recognize that the US may lack the words that we need. Now it's okay. Let's see if other places have the words that we need. And I, I started looking at Europe, especially around World War One, World War II, because around that time Europeans had, without intending to do so, were trying to wipe themselves off the planet. And when you're faced with ideas that could result in your own annihilation, a lot of people are going to start thinking up ideas to prevent themselves from killing themselves. And so that became like a repository for ideas and that's where some of these came from. So the first one that Jennifer talked about is this existential uh, idea from Jean-Paul Sartre that existence precedes essence. And this concept just completely upended hundreds of years of European thought because Europeans, philosophy for a long time had all been essence was the first, was the most important thing. And this emphasis on essence derives from uh, Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. And that idea is I think, and my capacity to think proves that I exist. And that means that my essence, which are my thoughts, my ideas, my beliefs are what make me human. And that's ridiculous. Because, you know, I, I was to talking to these guys and like I have a son, he's six months. He can't think in any way that we would recognize like what thinking is, you know, he just can't do it. He has no concept that he's a person or anything. He doesn't know anything. He's growing teeth right now. He doesn't even know what teeth are, you know, and so but he definitely exists. He exists before any of his thoughts before anything. And so I'm perplexed at how Europeans had this notion that thinking is what made you a, a, a human being when clearly there's human beings that matter a whole lot before they have even the capacity to think about themselves. Um, so this idea is really important to the United States because if you have a thought and this thought determines your humanity, that also entitles you to have thoughts that can erase somebody else's humanity. Because if, if I think that something, and that means I am that, that also means that if I think something about somebody else, they are that too. And this, whether the intent is this or not, it really allows you to justify dehumanizing and harming large swaths of people and feeling completely justified in doing so. And America's all about essence, as we would say in a philosophical way, like essence as in the idea of America or the idea of one group of people being better than another one or whatever. And so to get rid of this 
destructive concept, you have to attach into this existential perspective where existence precedes essence, where your humanity precedes your ideas. That doesn't mean that you can't have ideas. It just means that hu your humanity comes before it. So say, for example, I'm a really good basketball player and my identity, everything that I define myself as is attached to being really good at basketball. And then I wake up and I'm 40 and I can't play in the NBA anymore. If my essence is the most important thing, I will struggle to understand how I can live in the world. If my existence is more important than my essence, it'll be really easy for me to understand that this essence is gone I can't play at an NBA level anymore, but I'm still a, a person who has potential and can do all sorts of stuff and I won't be depressed, you know, stuff like that. And so that's one example of essence. And you can see how ethnocide, if you're going to destroy a whole group of people, you could justify that destruction by saying they're not really people. <laughs> um, and America does that a lot. Um, another concept, which is also a big existential one is bad faith or as Jean-Paul Sartre in French would say, mauvaise foi. And we are all accustomed to this idea of bad faith in that if you talk to someone and they lie, they're engaging in bad faith. They're trying to deceive you. But in existentialism, Sartre changed it up where what if I'm lying to myself, where I believe a lie to be true. So my actions aren't me intentionally lying with to other people, it's me acting out a lie, I just believe that lies the truth. So I think I'm being, I'm acting in good faith, but it's because I'm delusional. Like what, what is that? What's the word for that? And so that's bad faith where I would say like existential bad faith. And that's another big component of the United States where we have all sorts of ideas based on like various essences or I, you know, concepts of race or whatever that are just lies. They're not based on existence or reality. And we just believe them to be true. And so we then interact with people in this bad faith way, but we believe we have good intentions as we do it. That's really problematic. One of the biggest examples that Sartre gave in uh, his book, Being in Nothingness, was that of a waiter where he went to a restaurant and the waiter seemed a bit too precise in his actions where like this person like believed he was a waiter and not that he was a person who had made an agreement with the person at, that ran the restaurant to work as a waiter for X number of hours. This person thought his identity was that of a waiter and that this preceded his existence. This was like really hard for a lot of Americans to grasp because we're told that our profession is our identity so many times. And we believe that our, ident our, our identity, our profession defines ourselves where we are told that being a waiter is good and it's not. <laughs> so there's all sorts of like, essentially a lot of the philosophies, whether it's French or German that existed around this time provides a language that we can use to articulate facets of American life that we see all the time, but we haven't had a phrase for it. So we don't think that much about it. But once you have a word to identify this thing you see all the time, you can then start discussing it and thinking about it and making improvements. And so, how was that? That was great. Perfect. <laughs> I, I think about, I mean, just, you know, just, just this concept of using the term ethnocide to describe this like particular, this cultural erasure. And it just, you know, I mean, you talk about it largely within the context of like African-American history and, you know, your experiences as a black man. Um, I, but I, I, see, I can see parallels to it in like, um, in Asian American studies and Asian American history. Um, and, you know, one of the things that like Asian American scholars of Asian America have been talking about this issue of erasure for, you know, for a long time as have like the scholars of, I think all marginalized groups. Mm -hmm. um, simply because their like histories are not represented, right? Um, but one of the things that like really like one of the parallels that I really see is with Asian um, with with Asians and Asian Americans. I think one of the things that like roots their um, existence in in the United States is this like this this like relationship with white 
white Americans or like white society, American society that white people like need the labor. They need Asian, they need Asian labor. They love, um, or they, you know, they, they have an appreciation for Asian culture or they fetishize Asian culture. They appropriate it, but they don't want the people. Mm -hmm. Um, and that I just, I mean, I feel like, you know, the adoption of that term ethnocide is so relevant in this context. Yeah. So I'll say like when my work first, I first started getting it out there, some of the people that like gravitated towards it, like first, right off the bat were Asian Americans, you know, like, and it's funny as an African American, everyone thinks that my work is just geared towards my own community or something like that. And it's like, I'm talking about culture and the destruction of culture. Everyone is going to be able to see this and see how it impacts their culture. Um, and so like, for Asian Americans, it's, and I have a whole chapter in there and we actually trimmed it down a little bit in the book because my first draft of this came out of like 500 pages. I was, I was a real philosopher with the dense stuff here. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's, you know, with Asian Americans, there's that question that is always asked, like, where are you from? And the, the thing is, and this is like, it's weird to say, but the narrative of America, if you come here, is that you get white stuff. America doesn't say it that way. But like, if they told you that you came to America and you would get black stuff, nobody would come to America. Like, no, like, that's not, that's not a good advertising campaign to say you come here, you get treated like black people. Just not. So you come here, you try to do all the stuff and you want to get white stuff, even though they don't say it's white stuff. And then you don't get it because like, you can't be a white person. And it's one of these weird things where like, when the people, when Asian Americans are asked, where are you from? It's a question that feels as though it's trying to deny them of their Americanness because they don't look like a white person. And there's that, there's a, a clear tension there where I'm here, I'm trying to preserve my culture. There's a weird kind of like Faustian bargain where like I lose a little bit of it as I like pursue money um, and stability. And there's a tension that's gonna exist throughout that. And then for someone to look at you after you, like your parents have worked for so long to make sure you get like a good education, you are very proud to be, you know, American and where you come from in Asia and the person look at you and they don't even see any amount of America. They just see Asia. Like that is just like a punch in the stomach. And like that's articulated as an essentialist perspective where the society is focused on the essence or the idea of the people and not the existence of it where these Asian people exist in America. They are American. Clearly, they have a connection to some place that's not Europe. They look Asian. It's a continent that has billions of people in it. There's a lot of people that'll have this physical appearance just statistically, you know? And we should be able to have a conversation where you care about their existence, where their existence is as a person with Asian culture and American culture. And you should be able to ask questions where you're not trying to like have a tension between cultures while people are trying to like make a new one to a certain extent, which for me, it's really funny because I'm, I'm very curious about where people are from. And so whenever I see an Asian person, I always want to know like what country they like ancestrally come from because those countries have been doing stuff that's interesting for thousands of years. Like they've been doing stuff that's cool before America was even an idea. And I want to talk to people about that. I have to change it up how I say stuff so that they don't think I'm trying to erase the American identity. I'm like, no, I just want to focus on the Asian one because that one's real cool. Like I can't even ask, you know, I have to ask, you know, I have to frame it in other ways. So I don't, it's not triggering, which is, which is funny. Yeah, totally. And I mean, I think with Asians, uh, Asian Americans, there's also, you know, I think there's a real like divide, especially now, I think in the aftermath or in the midst of this like racial reckoning that we're in where, you know, some, I think a lot of Asians want that, like that to work their way up that racial hierarchy. And they want to like benefit from that, like being that close, that proximity to whiteness um, without, and, and there's such an ignorance of, I think this history of how 
Asians have been used as, a, you know, as, as basically a wedge between blacks and whites. And it's just, I mean, it just feels like more people need to know this and more people need to. And ethnocide like helps articulate that because what ends up happening is when Asians come to America and this is what most immigrant communities do, they try to find a place where there's people from their, their culture from that other country and they work together and try to use you know, their combined ingenuity resources to lift up the next generation, all sorts of stuff. It's like this whole collaborative thing makes perfect sense, you know, like who wouldn't do that? But for Black Americans, ethnocide has created a status quo where like white society at large has normalized the fracturing of Black communities at every opportunity. So it's this, there's this, narrative of like well one community is they're they're working hard and they can do it and they get the hard, it's like yeah yeah but like they are creating the ones that are successful and that's not like all of them because like it's it's just the idea that we're having conversation about asia as if it's some small place with not like a bunch of different cultures and like few people is ridiculous but you know that's a longer conversation but they are co working together to lift up their community and america says this is great, and we'll use that to say that Black people are lazy, while America has just normalized just like the systemic like disruption and exploitation of Black people in every way. Like you can't go at this, oh, we're going to fund schools based on the parents' income, and is it our fault that the Black people don't have the good jobs and they live in the bad neighborhood? No. Oh, you need a loan? Here, we're going to give you a loan that's at a higher interest rate than the white people that live down the street from you. And all, you know what? Just a coincidence. Just happens to be a coincidence that all these things that make your life harder happen. And then when you, your whole community doesn't send a bunch of kids to Harvard, I guess it's because you didn't work hard enough. Look at the Asians. Like it's, it's just a total joke. And when you have this thing that everyone sees and you don't have a word to articulate what's happening, then you just, it's just feelings. But what's happening is ethnocide. It's just that the ethnocide is being applied differently to Asian people because they're different people with different stuff and a different history. And it's happening to black people in a different way because the slave trade was a, a, a multi-century agenda of destroying African culture. And then chattel slavery was an agenda of having a mass of people in America who existed with their culture being destroyed and their communities being like fractured in perpetuity to like enrich white people and colonizers. Like if you don't have a word for that, how can you even talk about what's happening in your own society? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so speaking of, you know, of the transatlantic slave trade and civil war reconstruction. Um, so your book does this really good job of historically contextualizing American ethnocide and offering like your lived experiences of it too. Um, and in doing this, you present this narrative of American history that you have identified as the American cycle, um, which kind of counters the usual American narrative of progress. Um, so I wondered if you could describe what this cycle is and how it offers a more accurate lens for understanding cultural erasure and white supremacy. I love this question. I'll tell you, I've done a lot of talks on my book thus far since it came out in October. No one has asked me about the American cycle. And I find that like so bizarre because um, that, like, that chapter in and of itself is a textbook on its own. The fact that I had to condense it to a chapter was quite painful. Um, but essentially, this is how I think America functions, is we have an ethnocidal culture at our foundation, one that's, like, that's based on creating a language that normalizes division and exploitation and the creation of an other. And that other is created by one group of people, which in the book I call the ethnocider, exploiting the ethnocide. And that's just how ethnocide works. And America just has so many words to say that this is a good thing. <laughs> that's, you know, 
that's the corruption of our language. But it's, at a certain point, some Americans are going to think that that's not a good idea. Makes sense. And the tension that, hap that forms the American cycle is America was a democracy. It is a democracy. That's what we say. So you have a democracy, which is based around all the people being equal. They have representation. And it's a collective we, not something that's based on normalized division. That's what democracy is about. So there's democracy and the tension that comes from ethnocide, where ethnocide clearly doesn't want an authentic democracy. And this is the tension. And so there's four stages in the American cycle, and we've gone through the cycle. We're basically we've gone through it two times. We're at, the, we're at the end of the second one, and this is where like this is the vital part to see where we go as a society. So the, the first stage is the founding era, where they try to craft a democracy that also has ethnocide in it, where like they can live harmoniously together. And so that'd be, you know, the beginning of America, where you have the three-fifths compromise, you have the electoral college, you have all sorts, you have you have the North that doesn't have slavery, and you have the South that does have slavery. And they try to have a democracy that clearly isn't democratic. <laughs> um, and what they also do is this democracy is not democratic will end up giving the oppressors a disproportionate influence in shaping the democracy. And so the South had a larger influence in shaping America than the North. And the best example for this is the distinction between Virginia and Pennsylvania. Around the founding, Pennsylvania and Virginia both had about the same amount of, of eligible white male voters. But Virginia dominated American politics, and I think out of like the first 13 or 12 American presidents, like seven of them were from Virginia. The reason Virginia dominated is because of the two, as a, as a, because of a, the three-fifths compromise where they got representation for enslaving people in the South. So Virginia had more seats in the House of Representatives than Pennsylvania because they enslaved people. And that also meant they had more electoral college votes too. And so this not only is like undermines democracy, but encourages oppression. And that's what we had at the founding of the country. Eventually people realize this is bad. And so then we would have the abolition era where people want to abolish slavery. And so that's stage two, you try to abolish it. After abolition wins, stage three is you try, after, you try to reconstruct America in a way that's actually democratic. And America had the era of reconstruction were, you know, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. Basically, all the parts of America that we think about today that define America came from Reconstruction. You know, the parts that we, that we think are quite destructive, a lot of those came before Reconstruction. Um, and so what make, made America great is actually Reconstruction. But America back then, and still to this day, frankly, doesn't have the stomach for what equality would look like. And so Reconstruction only lasted 12 years. And then there was the era of redemption where the Southerners after Reconstruction ended started trying to undo all the progress of Reconstruction. And this shows the corruption of American language where it's called redemption, where they want to redeem the South. And by redeeming America, they meant make it oppressive and not democratic. So like redemption's a bad thing, but we call it a good thing. Because, you know, if you live in a place that's bad, doing bad things will be described as doing good things. <laughs> and so the era of redemption happened and they undid everything. And next thing you know, the 20th century starts and it's Jim Crow. And this is where we, we get controversial. But we all know Jim Crow is bad. No one's denying that. But Jim Crow is the second founding era. This is where they had another attempt at having democracy and systemic racial oppression worked hand in hand where you know they had they had the south that was separate but equal we knew that wasn't equal but we did know it was separate and we basically had apartheid from the early 20th century all the way to the 1960s just normalized apartheid that's the that was the goal of the founding era <laughs> and we tried it again in the 20th century and we did it again so next thing you know we have to abolish, try to abolish Jim Crow. That's what the civil rights movement was. Lots of people try to talk about the civil rights movement as being the second reconstruction, but no, 
I don't think it is. I, I think it's the second abolitionist movement because the goal of it was to abolish Jim Crow. And by abolishing Jim Crow, you would just reclaim the rights that we had won in Reconstruction. So it wasn't actually reconstructing. It was just getting back the parts that we earned in the previous Reconstruction. So this is a second abolitionist movement. And this is where the abolitionist movement gets really complicated, is that due to Jim Crow and the Redeemers movement and the, 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 the progress of Reconstruction, you couldn't have overtly racist laws in America anymore. You had to have laws and policies that had no racist language, but had racist outcomes. That was the goal, like separate but equal doesn't say racist. We know the outcome is segregation, <laughs> um, but that doesn't say something bad in it linguistically. And so to abolish slavery, the first time it's called slavery. That's one thing, we got to abolish that. What America did after you couldn't just use racist language is they would get every facet of existence that could influence someone who's not white and find language to undermine that person's existence without using racist language. That takes a long time to adequately undo because you can't say the language is racist. You have to like see the impact and get enough data, enough whatever to show the impact. So the abolitionist movement, it started in the 1960s and I feel it went all the way to Obama. And then Obama was the, was the second reconstruction where he tried to reconstruct America in a new equitable way with a philosophy that stemmed from people of color and not from white Americans. And I think clearly, you know, Affordable Care Act, um, you know, a lot of, you know, first Latina uh, Supreme Court justice. Uh, we had a lot of progress for, for the LGBTQ community. And this doesn't mean Obama was perfect. There's definitely things you could have done more, but Reconstruction also had a lot of opposition from people too, where Reconstruction could have done more too. Um, and then uh, Reconstruction ended and Donald Trump came and that was the second redemption movement. And the thing that's really eerie about this is that the rhetoric that Trump used to win is the same rhetoric that they use in the 1860s and 1870s, where re the redemption movement was to redeem the South or like make the South great again. And Donald Trump's narrative was make America great again, not overtly racist language, but language that if implemented would have racist outcomes. And so Trump, you know, didn't win reelection. He hasn't gone away. And now Donald, uh, Joe Biden, who was basically Obama's you know, deputy, he's trying to continue reconstruction. And we just kind of have to see if America is at a place where we're capable of continuing reconstruction, or are we gonna to succumb to what the cycle's always been and redeem the country by making it how it was when it was founded, you know, perpetually divided and oppressive, but just use flowery language to describe bad things. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, just, thinking about it, thinking about, you know, the past couple hundred years as like, you know, as this cycle that has kind of, you know, happened where, you know, we're at the tail end of the second cycle. It, it is, it is a really compelling um, way to understand not only the past, but also like the present. And I think one of the things that, you know, whenever I teach reconstruction, to uh, the like US history survey course that I teach, we always begin with reconstruction. And the way that I always frame it is like, you have this moment, you know, especially like during the like radical reconstruction period where it's like, there's, you know, like more black people elected to public office than there ever has been. The state constitutions that are coming out of the South are the most progressive, have never been as progressive. Mm -hmm. And you have this one moment where it's like, wow, you could really have some like real meaningful change. Um, and then it kind of just crumbles and then you get, yeah, it's like you, you come out of it, they come out of it on the other side with Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. um, and I can totally see this period now as like, yeah, this is, but you know, a it's redemption. The same thing. And we're, we're, we're not even as ambitious as they were in the 18 in the 1800s, which is like, you know, we have this narrative, the inevitability of progress, but if you just think 
of just how ambitious and bold people were in the 1860s. It's unimaginable that Americans would be that bold today. Like just, if you just, the sheer numbers of enslaved people in the United States, it was, you know, at the bare minimum, we're talking 20% of the population. And in these Southern states, a lot of these Southern states, it was about 50-50. South Carolina, it was like 60% were enslaved. That's nuts to think about. Georgia about 50, you know, None of those people were even considered to be human beings prior to the Civil War. And in a decade, they became people and they could vote. Like we're talking an enfranchisement of about 20% of the population as a whole, but the enfranchisement of like 50% of a state's population like that. America has discussions every day about like undocumented workers. And if we could like accommodate just giving them citizenship. It's like, that's a nothing compared to what happened in Reconstruction. That should be easy. Like there's so much space here. They're already here. They already have families. Yeah, of course. And then we should have the vision to be able to create policies in the future that you know hopefully doesn't necessitate to, like, people to live here undocumented for like large chunks of their life. But that's just beyond our will at this point, which is a fraction of the will in the 1860s. So like we have this narrative of, uh, <laughs> we, we, we have a narrative of America progressing um, and it's a nice one. Is it true? Like if you, if you it's kind of like, it's really easy. It's hard to climb up a mountain. That takes a long time, really fast to fall off one, you know? So, <laughs> Well, and I think it begs the question is, yeah, it's like this, this narrative of progress, like, yeah, progress for who, you know, um, and, and, I, and if, and, but also like the same thing, like if you progress and you imagine that progress means you can't fall off the mountain, you're just delusional. No, like, sure. You can climb up, but that doesn't mean you can't slip and fall back down. You gotta be wiser and more aware of history to know that like, it's hard. It's not inevitable. We're just like aren't innately magic people that just always get better. Like, no, that's just delusions. And if you look at American history, it becomes even apparent that like not only are those delusions, just regardless of like how good you are as a people, it's just not accurate for our society. And it's easy to believe stuff that's not true. We don't have the language to articulate what is true. And that's where ethnocide kind of like opens the door for a new vocabulary. Absolutely, like it's like a reality check for yep. people. Um, so do you think that, um, do you think that ethnocide like in, in an American context is like a one size fits all process? Meaning like, does it, do you think it functions differently for different marginalized groups? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like. Yeah, there. You know, it, it's kind of, it's kind of like say we're using sports as an analogy. Like, basketball is basketball, but that doesn't mean that each team plays basketball the same way, you know. But we will know that that's basketball. So, like, that's ethnocide. How ethnocide is going to show up in the African American community is going to be different than how it shows up in the Asian American community, it'll still be the same thing. It just have like a different manifestation because the people are different. If you're going to destroy a people's culture, the approach of what you're going to destroy and why you want to destroy it will be different. Um, and so you know, like, and, and, and also clearly it's different for indigenous people too, because for indigenous, it's a combination of genocide and ethnocide where, you know, if you look at the, 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 the schools that they wanted to, you know, to, to Americanize indigenous children and make them no longer practice their culture because they could, you know, that's clearly ethnocide. That's different for, you know, black people, the destruction of, of African culture was just done from the moment they were forced onto boats across the Atlantic. And clearly that's gonna result in a lot of people dying because, you know, you got it. They're going to terrorize people and kill a lot of people, but the end goal is going to be to keep the people without the culture. Uh, for like immigrant communities, it's kind of different. Like they're coming to the country 
under the pretenses that America's like different than what it is, that they can get white stuff without being white. And now there's a, a tension in like how much it's like a give and take of how much of my culture am I willing to like sacrifice in order to get like economic stability and like can I, you know, like that's a thing where there's like economic pressures and not necessarily, you know, terrorism as the main aspect of it. But I think the, 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 the terror that's been inflicted upon Asian Americans over the last year or so is a reminder that for, you know, that threat of the presence of non-European people with uh, a culture is perceived as a threat uh, to some people in this country. And that's clearly, you know, ethnocidal because they don't want all the Asian people to leave because they want the labor, you know, uh, you know, railroads don't make themselves, you know, it's like, yeah. so. Yeah, totally. And I mean, I think, you know, in, in regards to the attacks on Asian Americans, like in, you know, in the past year, it's like, one of the things that's kind of disturbing or troubling to me is that like the responses, like Asian American, like community responses to this like uptick in racial violence really is like a call for more policing, right? It's like a call for like, um, for, for the police and, you know, elect the electeds to like care about Asian populations. Um, and that just, I mean, it's so it's, it's obviously at odds with like other big racial stuff that's happening in this country right now. Um, and, you know, it just, it feels like there's still just a general disconnect between, um, between Asian Americans and like black Americans, both of whom are like targets of racial violence. Totally. And it's because we don't have the language to articulate what's happening. Uh, the, you know, if you live in a society that's, that's normalizing division as a foundational principle, there's not going to be a desire for people of color to be able to work together. You know, that like those, the people who are getting exploited, they don't want them to work together because that will make it more likely that they'll find a way to not be exploited. And for immigrant communities, like like I said, they 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 come to the U.S. under the premise that like it's a different place than it is, and they don't want to come here and believe that they're getting the treatment that Black people get. Like that's that's gonna be like a really harsh like gut punch, where like you like literally move across an ocean to get what the people who run the country get, and you end up getting a uh, a a the treatment of the people who are being oppressed like that's yeah. that's going to be like rough that that'll make people cry make them think they made like a big massive mistake in their whole life get that um and then the other thing that's 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 going to be difficult is that the thoughts that will fix the problem also won't come from white america like that this won't like that's not going to be that's not they're not they're not going to spend as much time thinking about the nuances of oppression yeah. black people are going to think about that and the, the 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 problem of the discourse and this is why i hope my book has like a, a big impact on people is that the discourse is still we use terms about race it's a cultural problem like 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 asian people are only really considered a race, <laughs> like when they go someplace else, you know? Yeah. Like there's a continent we're filled with so many cultures and they get here and we act like, like Cambodians and Koreans are like the same. <laughs> like, it's a joke. Just the idea that Chinese is just like one monolithic thing. Like there's more people in China than all of Europe. And we act like they just like, they're the same. So it's a cultural problem. And once you can cultivate a language that's about culture and your culture being harmed because of structures, then it makes it easier for there to be a discourse amongst black people and Asian Americans and Latinos and indigenous people where we can say it's happening differently in our communities, but we have a word for what it is. But if we're talking about race, well, <laughs> That's a that's a divisive word 
at its core and our concepts for race in America derive from ethnocide. You know, like, like we say like the black race, there's no place on the map called black. Like black is just an idea that like these Europeans wanted to give to the African people whose culture they destroyed. So they could say, if you have any of this color, not culture, cause that got, that got smashed, you, something bad's happened. These people, you know, so like even the discourse of race is a derivative of ethnocide. And so like by using the language of race, you're using a language that condones oppression. And as a person of color, it's a language that condones your own oppression, which that's not gonna help you liberate yourself. And so. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, absolutely. And I, so you're touching on what I kind of wanted, <laughs> what, I, what I wanna ask in the next and last question before we shift to Q and A, um, which is he, like language is part of the solution. So like, can you, can you talk more about that? Like what, how do we, how do we as like a society resist and push back against ethnic side? Yeah. So, so this is a, a, a fascinating question that I get all the time because in America, we act like language is not important. And I think that's because of ethnocide because if I'm going to oppress someone, they won't interact with me if they know I'm going to oppress them. So the words that come out of my mouth can't have a connection to my actual actions. You know, that's, that would be, and I talk about this in the book, that's an example of bad faith. So we live in a place where like talk is cheap. Uh, you know, words don't have meaning. Uh, things are easier said than done. Where the, ex the expectations that your words don't matter. What matters are your actions. But if you don't have words or philosophy that guides your actions, then like, what are your actions? And so there's a complete like fracturing of just like a foundational part of being a person, which is I say something out of my mouth that means something and I will act based on that meaning because the words that come out of my mouth need to matter. I need to be intentional about what I'm saying. We live in a place where people don't expect to be intentional or for their words to matter. Like if someone says, I'm gonna go get coffee, but they say, we should grab coffee. We don't expect that person to actually follow up and get coffee. It's just a nice thing to say but it's empty and meaningless. And so that's the first problem that like, we just live in a place that we don't like to think about it where we just expect our words to not matter at all. If you wanna create a good place, you need to live in a place where your words do matter. And so, you know, that would be in and of itself countering ethnocide. And by knowing the word ethnocide and knowing that that word matters, you're already like engaging in the process because if you know that word exists, you know that it matters, then you're either going to consciously make decisions saying, I'm going to continue ethnocidal stuff, or I'm going to think ethnocide doesn't matter or doesn't exist, or I'm going to start acting in a way that I know isn't detrimental. <laughs> and that's what happens. So now you start being more intentional about what you say. You start looking for words to describe this, the problems, and now that creates better actions. And so the key thing that people need to realize is that like, if you believe your words matter, that naturally will impact your actions. And the, another thing that's also really bizarre is when you live in a society where people don't expect the words to matter, what they often are looking for is for like some divine person to just tell them what they need to do and so if I just like thoughtlessly follow what a person says, then I'll do good stuff. That's not my goal here. The goal is to teach people. And if I can teach people how to like think and speak in a like a constructive and not destructive way, that should create constructive actions. That's just a really natural thing that's supposed to occur. And it's really fascinating how that, and I get this all the time, that's a very foreign idea for so many people in the US. 
that they don't think their words matter. They don't think that they have the, the capacity to do what they say. And what they want is for me to tell them what to do. And then they just like depend on me to tell them how to do stuff. I'm not here for that. And so that's what, that's what it's about. And so once you get to the end of the book, you know, I start putting out you know, and how the book is structured is by the end, you should have a new vocabulary. Like each chapter ramps up the words that I, I use in the previous one that by the end, it's almost like you're speaking a new language. And that language also includes words you need to say to like be constructive. Um, and so I think by the end of the book, it becomes evident how uh, words can change things because you will just start describing your own society differently and moving through it differently. And you'll see that, you know, pretty quickly, I think. Totally. Thank you so much. That's, I mean, yeah, I think just like the fundamental idea that, um, that, that we, that, that we live in a society that like values actions over words. It's like that. Right. And there, and there's no thought that's supposed to guide the actions. Yes, exactly. So it's yeah. just like yeah. thoughtless actions. Mm -hmm. That's chaos. Yeah. That is a nightmare. You know, you, it shouldn't be surprising that Americans love watching zombie movies and TV shows. You know, those are, that's a whole horde of people that act all day long, full of actions. They can't speak and they can't think. And Americans are like, ah, and then they casually describe themselves as I'm a zombie at work. I will, I'm a zombie. It's like, yeah, yeah. If you live in a place that says language and thoughts are nothing and actions are everything, you're definitely going to feel like a zombie. You're going to project that into the world. <laughs> you know? Totally, totally. All right. Well, thank you, Barrett. I think um, that kind of wraps up the questions that I had for you. Um, and now we can shift into um, the audience Q&A portion. And Eliza Canty Jones from um, the Oregon Historical Society is actually going to moderate this portion for us. Hi, everyone. Uh, huge benefits of partner program. Tim DeRoche's Wi-Fi is not going great. So I'm really um, pleased to be able to be here. I've been uh, listening in with my literal bowl of popcorn. So thank you all for a great conversation. You know, you're talking about language here, and I really appreciate that. And one of the, you know, it's something we spend a lot of time doing in our work is thinking about very minute word choices, right? And I'm thinking about, um, it, there's been references to America throughout this conversation. What does America want to do? What will America do? You know, thinking about this, this American cycle, what is America going to do next? And I'm really interested to, to hear from both of you really in that context of how do you define America in that framework, right? So when we're thinking about what is America going to do in this time period, what has America done in the past, um, and really appreciate pushing back against this progress narrative. What do you mean when you're talking about America in that framework? Could you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, you want me to go first? You want to go? No, go ahead, Barrett. Yeah, perfect. So like, I think the fact that that question is like significant highlights the profound problem that we're talking about, where like most societies if you ask them what they are, what they are is an attachment to the land in which they've lived for the longest time. Like, like they, the name of the place in which they live is like they name the place and then the people said, I'm from here. And they say like, we have traditions and customs and way of life and, and theories of how to live that are based on being in this place and trying to like create stuff so that we can live here forever. You know, not that it's for, here is the best place ever, but like, what else would you do? Why would you make something so that your time in this place could be short? It doesn't make sense. That's how basically every place on the planet's tried to live since like the beginning of time. America has decided to do a completely different narrative where like this place, it's just an idea. And this idea has no attachment to the land and it has no collective desire to work together to sustain it. What it really has is a connection to an idea of a, pe a people from like a continent that's like really tiny and cold for the most part, being better 
than people in other places. And we can live here at the expense of all of these other people. And we know that this idea is really bad. So we don't really want to have a clarity about what America is. We want to exist as if it's just a question that we ask and don't care to answer. And so it's an example of like a people trying to live like, as like in an acultural way because there's no collective we in the society. There's no attachment to the place. There's no clear desire to like live in that place in perpetuity. And that clearly is gonna create a lot of problems. And the way to solve that problem is to actually exist with culture, how people have lived forever. And America doesn't like doing that. And I think a, a key reason why they don't like doing it is colonizers when they came over here came with this an idea of whiteness where like if they have a drop of the existence of something that's not European, then their whole essence is gone. And if you live in a place that's not Europe and you can only survive by not touching stuff that's not Europe, you're clearly not gonna value the land in which you live. You're not gonna value any of the people that are there. And you're not really gonna care about sustaining it. And so there's a narrative of like not being cultured. And so when we're talking about America, we're talking about in many ways, just like a, a historical, unsustainable, like status quo that likes to live in an idea of being perpetually great and that idea trumping the existence of everyone that's there. And then let's see if we can solve these problems while being essentially like delusional all the time. And, you know, that's not really going to be helpful at anything. And so America is mostly an ethnocidal idea that I think as we get, we become more empathetic as a society and we try to interact with people as human beings and equitably, we realize that the idea isn't sustainable and we need to come up with a new one. And we struggle to get there because it caused, it requires us to ask some really profound, uncomfortable questions about the nature of a gigantic country that was created. So that's what I think of America. <laughs> um. I can, yeah, I can, um, yeah. yeah, sure. I, I can try to follow up on that. <laughs> so I guess, uh, you know, maybe one way that I can, I, I kind of want to try to answer this by also answering a question that popped up in the Q and a from Nancy mm -hmm. Dawson, um, that asks it's to, to me and it asks about the Oregon historical quarterly article in which, um, I mentioned, this Asian American scholar, Gary Okahiro, who makes this, he makes this argument um, about the, the relationship between the, the margins and the mainstream and how the, the people on the margins are make the mainstream. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I kind of think that like this idea of, I mean, I don't know, to, 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 to improve or to, to really like, you know, make this society a better one. I do think that that change, um, that change is going to come from the outside, like that change. And by outside, I mean, I'm talking like, you know, from people who have been generally excluded from the making of this nation. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of this is, founded on, or I guess it's based on the idea that like people on the margins, maybe this like belief that Barrett is talking about in like, you know, people coming to this country because they believe in America, they want the white stuff, right? Um, but maybe they also like, they, they come to this country because they like believe that the system is, you know, is, is one way. And then they get here and they realize that it's actually not that way. Um, and then there are, you know, these like, there's this constant push from coming from the margins um, to improve the system so that it, you know, so that it works for everybody. Um, and I think that that's like, 
that push that's coming from the margins is ultimately what is going to improve the ideals, like to make to it, it will in, improve the ideals of this nation, and it will help to make sure that like that is working for everybody in this country. So just to add on to that really quick, like that goes to the American cycle, where like democracy as an idea is a great idea. People should want to have a society that at a, at a philosophical level exists to represent everyone and give everybody a voice and an opportunity to like have a, a big role of responsibility of making the society better. Anybody that lives in a country that is oppressive or you know has gone through some sort of collapse or whatever, the narrative of democracy is you should you should want to get that. But America at a cultural level is ethnocidal. It's trying to destroy people's culture. And so you know the the solutions come from the people on the margins, the people of color, because they're here to sustain culture. They're trying to sustain their own culture. And by the fact that they live next to each other, there's a high likelihood that like Asians and Latinos and black are gonna mix and they gotta have a, a new, like, like, all right, how do I do like black and Asian stuff? Like what's this new culture look like where we preserve it? These are the thoughts that are gonna happen from the people that exist to preserve culture. And that's sustainability. And th that's where the ideas come from. That's why like reconstruction had all these revolutionary ideas because it was ideas like this, how we sustain culture for everybody and not division and exploitation. Like the reconstruction that I hope happens now will be a reconstruction where all the people of color collaborate to sustain their culture while merging culture. And the white Americans who are also in this commitment to create a sustainable culture work with us just like they did during reconstruction. So like there's, there's the tension. And so, but the, the, the revolutionary ideas come from the margins because they're less attached to the bad ideas. There's a less of a commitment to think the bad ideas are great. Like I have far less of a desire to think that Thomas Jefferson or our founding fathers were like the smartest people, but like white people have a way more commitment to think those guys are brilliant. And that makes sense. They're from their tribe, not my tribe, you know? Right, yeah. You know, I'm really, I'm so struck by this um, idea of thinking about the American cycle, and this is such a helpful framework. And so I'm thinking about two things. One is um, the ways in which the, the declaration, America is a nation of immigrants, is a form of ethnocide, right? <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, it's so, every time you hear that, and oftentimes very well-meaning people are trying to be inclusive with this statement, and it is a total negation of thousands and thousands and thousands of years of history and a whole genocide, you know, yeah. on this continent. I'm right? not an immigrant. Right. Yo, yeah, right. There's that yeah. too, right? So it's the, right, it's, it, it discounts enslavement and, and, and theft yeah. of human beings from Africa and it discounts genocide of Native people, right? <laughs> so, so the, yeah. So Go ahead. I'll just, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, right. 100%. The ways that, that, that this language, could, but then I'm also thinking about this American cycle and the significance or maybe lack thereof of the changes in immigration policy in 1965, right? And this, Jennifer, is, you know, where some of your own scholarship, you know, draws in. So where do you see this sort of the 1965 Immigration Act? This is coming in the midst of the civil rights movement. You know, you've talked about some of this place in the in the American cycle. Where does that fit into the American cycle? And just maybe more broadly thinking about immigration and ethnocide and the ways that, as you spoke about, you know, earlier in the conversation, this can be used to, um, you know, to actually divide, right? And I'll just add one more onto here because I'm just going to turn my mic off and let you all go after this. I think the two of you, that there's a great question in the Q and A that's talking about adding to this saying, you know, we've got multicultural and then we've also got united, right? As these sort of ways of thinking about what is what do these words mean in, or the potential for America or in our history? So I'll throw all that out there, answer whatever you feel like. Can I, can I go first real quick? Okay, I'll go, I'll go quick and then, you know, but the the immigration policies in the 1960s that's that's just that's abolition because if you look at all of the laws that the America's first major immigration laws were immigration laws that prevented Asian people from coming to America and owning property and all that kind of stuff you know like they didn't need to create immigration laws 
pertain to African people, you know, like the laws that they created for immigration for African people was the end of slavery on this date, you know, like that, that was it. There wasn't like boats of Africans coming here to work. Um, and so like our regressive immigration laws came about be during the era of redemption and Jim Crow, where they wanted to prevent people who weren't uh, white or European from coming here. And so the narrative of America being a nation of immigrants, it's a narrative of like white immigrants and trying to make that be the narrative of the society as a whole. Lyndon Johnson is a great example of abolition, like abolitionists in the 1800s, a lot of white people, you know, a lot of white people were abolitionists and they were working to, to with African-Americans to end like this ethnocidal norm. Lyndon Johnson's clear an example of that. And as more people from around the world we're trying to come to America in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Our immigration policies were also uh, ethnocidal. And so that's that continuation. And you can see now that the, the America that we like now, that we rally around, the theory behind this America comes from people of color. You know, <laughs> like, like we, I'm sure there's lots of white people who are abolitionists, but I'll, I'm pretty sure that the black people want to abolish slavery first. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, like, you know, second place is pretty good, but I it didn't come in first in that regard of wanting to abolish slavery or abolish Jim Crow. Um, and so I think that's also like a tension that America has to reckon with, where like the ideals that we articulate as being American that make us proud as American, a lot of these ideas just didn't come from like white Americans. They came from black Americans and the progress from these ideas happened because white Americans supported these black ideas. Um, and that's kind of how, how, how it shakes out. And, you know, now it's their black ideas while also Asian ideas and Latino ideas because we're more diverse now because of the abolitionist movement of the 1960s. Yeah, I think, um, I think, the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, like that, it, that cannot be understood in a vacuum. It has to be understood in relation to the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And it, so I think that those, you know, those, um, I think like overhauls really are part of, as Barrett said, like it, it is abolition. Um, I also think that you, I don't know how this really like relates to like this earlier period of abolition, like in, you know, within this American cycle, but like there's also the cold war that needs to be factored in. And, you know, a lot of the civil rights changes, like the, one of the reasons why I think the civil rights movement is able to achieve as much as they did is largely because America was pretty embarrassed about like its hypocrisy and its reputation. And it was very concerned about its reputation around the world. Like how can the United States say that the American system is the best system? It's better than communism when there is this like huge racial problem that the country hasn't grappled with. Um, and so I think a lot of that you know, pushing through civil rights legislation, pushing through immigration reform, that oh, the, there's a lot of pressure there from people who are really worried about America's image around the world, which I think is, I mean, it's like, you, you kind of just wish that like, they would have made these changes because it's the right thing to do as opposed to like, this is what's gonna make America look good. Um, but I think that that is, the case. And um, I guess, you know, in, in thinking of that, like multicultural versus unified, it's kind of also like, it's like melting pot and salad bowl, like that type of, you know, those, those analogies. Um, I mean, I guess, I don't know, Barrett, I don't know where, where you stand on this, but from, in my mind, I'm like, you know, nothing's going to get better until there's a seat for everybody or until there's space for like everybody here to like be here and to exist as they want to exist. Um, so I, the, yeah, I think, I think the melting pot and salad bowl and whatever mosaic analogy is just like, you know, 
propaganda wouldn't be like the right word, but like you don't have a melting pot when you don't have a word for what the outcome of the melting is. You know, like we don't have the word for the outcome. So we're not melting. It's just something that we like to say. And a salad bowl is like, that means we get to live harmoniously while not like really mixing. That clearly is not a thing that is gonna happen because if you recognize people as human beings, there's a high likelihood if you live in a place surrounded by people of a bunch of different races, you're gonna find someone that's really awesome that's gonna be a different vegetable or whatever it is. And now your child is not gonna be like half of each vegetable, you know, you're not, like you're not gonna have like one child that's gonna be like one vegetable and the other one's the other one. Like they're gonna be a mixture of the vegetables. And we don't have a word for what that is because we don't have a language for a culture of people. We just have a language for divisive races of people. And we like to have a narrative that these different races can live together harmoniously without mixing forever. And that we don't need to have a word for the inevitable mixing. And so it's just very problematic. It's like one really simple way to think about this. And this like still blows my mind that like, I don't think most, most people just don't think about this, but the South prior to the civil war and still largely to this day, like prior to the civil war, we're talking like a lot of these states were 50-50. And they were 50-50 for 200 years, 100, 150 years. And people think it makes sense that there's still a lot of white people in that area. Like, how does that make sense? If it's like half black and half white and they're being treated equally and they're all human beings, they would just start mixing. And we would just have like a whole area with a massive population of mixed race people. Like that's just what would happen. That's not, that's not saying that one group is better than the other. That's, it's just, that's what happened. Since, since the loving decision, interracial marriages have like gone through the roof in the US and that's a really short period of time. And you're just trying to say that like a whole swath of the country that at the bare minimum, we're talking like 30% is black. And for hundreds of years, they've never developed a mixed race population that's like significant. Like that's not natural. So, that's a problem. And so we, the melting pot and salad bowl and mosaic is just a narrative that makes people feel good about like normalized division and oppression. If we want to have like progress, we need to start thinking of the words for what that mixed group of people is. And until we start developing that, like we're just not going to go anywhere. I think what you just said about that's not natural is is really important because I think, you know, what, what we've learned from scholars like the two of you and others who look at many of the topics that you've talked about tonight is that it takes a lot of work to institutionalize and maintain separation, to maintain this oppression. It's on behalf of a pretty small number of people. Like it's, it, you know, it gives folks like me who carry whiteness certain privileges that are not insignificant and has for generations, but it's for a pretty small group of people who are continually coalescing power, right? And so I just, I, you know, I, I think we're closing the end of our time. So I want to, you know, throw out a question a little bit about language and future, because that's what we always ask historians to tell us about the future, right? But we've seen, you know, as somebody's noting in, in the, the, the questions today, the, a, a brilliant person is noting, thanks Kim for being here, that, you know, we saw a momentous occasion today. A black woman was confirmed to the Supreme Court of the United States. We saw earlier this week, uh, a black man, Chris Smalls, organize a brand new union um, and, and win against an incredibly powerful company, Amazon, right? So we're seeing the kind of leadership that some of you all are talking about. What is the language that we can have? What can we draw on to really prevent, as Kimberly Moreland says, this second reconstruction from crumbling? Because I think we can all see the very powerful attacks that are on it right now. There's attacks on the 14th Amendment. There's explicit attacks on the loving decision and what undergirds it, right? So this is happening, right? What, are, what is the language that we can be using to prevent this, these attacks from succeeding? Do you want me to go first? 
Nope. <laughs> I want you to go first. Oh, yeah, I'll go first. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess the, the thing that's fascinating is like the examples you just gave of progress are of Black people doing things that like white people didn't think were possible. And like, that's just like what as a community we're obligated to do all the time. That's it's like what we're doing in our community towards reconstruction, that's just the status quo. Like we, if black people exist in the society to live in the way that white people think we can live, we do nothing, like absolutely nothing. It'd be like, it'd just be sad. Um, and so that the progress that black people are doing, we should be able to see that as like the expectation of what people should do and not, a you know, it is remarkable. It can't talk down to it, but that is indicative of how much other people need to start thinking beyond what America says is possible. Like that's how you reconstruct it. I think a lot of white Americans have a really like emotional attachment to the idea that like America is good and it'll just fix its problems. And if I let the American machine do what it says it'll do, it'll work out. And then the examples that they give of it working out are black people being remarkable and doing things that the machine said they could never do. Like that doesn't make any sense. And so, you know, when I look at the Katanji Brown Jackson thing today, the thing that always annoys me is that she'll do something remarkable. And this is not just Katanji, but this happens to pretty much any African-American that's doing something that's been considered unprecedented. There will be a whole slew of just rude, repugnant, obstruction, disrespect, and America doesn't seem to have a language for saying that those people are bad. Like we have a language for saying that, like, I don't like them and you know, they're morally bad. We should think that these people when they're dead are gonna live in a place that's like not cool. <laughs> Let's worry about that later. Like we're all alive. We need to be able to articulate why they're bad in a context that matters for existence. And we don't seem capable of doing any of that. And so if you can't have a language that can precisely articulate why people are bad and what they're doing and why it harms everybody and why we need to imagine new laws to reconstruct things that like transcends the normalization and the tolerance of their systemic badness, they were not gonna fix anything. You know, like the amount of times I hear people talk about Obama and they're like, man, he should have done more of this and more of that and blah, blah, blah. And they never have a conversation about the obstructionism that he got was unprecedented. That we know the Republicans came up with ways to prevent legislation from going through that had never happened before. And we're expecting this black guy who has surpassed all of our expectations to anticipate the opposition doing things they've never done before and then to imagine how to get past that. And then we'll have conversations about how he needs to be better. And we don't have the language to say how bad these other people are. Like, if you can't articulate bad, then how are you going to win? Like, well, you can't, you're not going to do anything. And so I'm more concerned about white America and the rest of America cultivating a language to accurately describing why people are bad and why it's harmful. I'm not that worried about Black people doing stuff that transcends the imagination of white people. Like, we do that all the time, and that's why America is a good place. <laughs> like that, that's just facts just look at history that, that's what happens um so yeah well I think and part of this like I mean yes to everything that that you've said Barrett and I think also really just to like put it out there much more explicitly is like I think there just needs to be like white people white men like there just needs to be a yielding of power like it just, there needs to be like a, a redistribution of power and decision-making as a whole. Um, and to, I mean, not only to normalize, like this society needs to, you know, do, do a lot of like introspection and a lot of tearing down and rebuilding. Um, and, 
you know, we need to normalize uh, this language for, um, you know, for, for explaining why things are bad, but we also just need to like normalize that, that this country is like a, that it is just like a diverse one. Right. But like, I'm not saying that we need to like normalize. I don't know. It's not that we need to like normalize like these like initiatives to diversify. It's like, we just need to normalize the fact that there are like lots of different people living in this, living in this country. Like I, I just to real quick, just to add on to that, like the diversity of America has always been the reality. Like the fact that we think that it wasn't like, if there's a whole continent full of indigenous people, there are different tribes that have a diversity that's, you know, the same as the diversity of Asia or Europe or whatever. And then a whole bunch of people from a continent that are from the different countries in that continent all come here. Clearly it's going to be diverse. And then they, they force African people on boats and we're here like, it's going to be diverse. The idea that we have a narrative that like, it's not foundationally diverse is just propaganda. But one thing I would just, I'll add to talk about, um, like the distribution of power and a reconstruction idea. And this is a, a part in the book. There's this German idea, uh, this philosopher, uh, Friedrich um, uh, Hegel came up with this. And it's the master-slave dialectic. This is the, a dialectic, which is like the conversation that the master and like the serf or the slave has. And the master's conversation is he has all the power and none of the responsibility. So like if he works his slaves really hard and there's a great crop yield, he's like, I'm a genius, I'm the best. And if the crop yield isn't that good, those slaves are lazy, you know? The slave has a relationship where he has all of the responsibility and none of the power. You know, like he, if he works really hard and there's a great crop yield, he doesn't get any power from that, but he's responsible for all of this stuff. America at a foundational level, you just think about it, it's like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and people that like agreed with slavery or at least agreed to like a let it exist. They have a concept of freedom that comes from the perspective of being the master, where they want to accumulate power so that they can be irresponsible. They don't want to get power so that they can be responsible for other people. So you look at all these representatives where like they don't look, they don't seem to look out for their constituents at all. People of color, when they become elected officials, they look out for their constituents all day long. And whenever they make some mistake that could make them seem irresponsible, everything comes down on them. Like, oh, you, did, you didn't do this. Everyone attacks them. But there's not an expectation that the people that are obtaining power to be irresponsible are ever expected to be responsible. This is a key thing. And because like having power isn't problematic. Having power so that you can be irresponsible is very problematic. And I think that's a norm that America has. You can look at like CEOs where they get so much power, it insulates them from responsibility. They take a company and they go, oh, you did a horrible job. You destroyed the company. Here's $50 million. So you don't have to work the rest of your life. Like what? You know, you work at Fox News, you get caught like sexually assaulting ladies. They pay you like millions of dollars so that you just like have a parachute while you like live in shame for the rest of your life. Well, they don't actually shame you. They like, you go make a podcast or something, you know? Like that's just a norm. And so that's the problem. Like if we give people redistribute power, but the notion is you get a power so you can be irresponsible, we're all gonna be bad. That's it. And if freedom is viewed as obtaining power to be irresponsible, then we're just gonna be a bad place and that's just how it's been for the whole time. When Black people try to reconstruct society, they use their power to be responsible and do things that make people's lives, lives better, such as, you know, we'll make it harder for people that will advocate that you can't get guns and kill kids. Let's be responsible that like kids can go to school and not feel like they're gonna get shot. That's something. A whole other group of people are like, I'm not responsible for that. That was a bad guy with a gun. Someone else is responsible to make good people and then those good people get guns and then they won't do bad things with it. Like that's the narrative. And so we just don't have a narrative for the normalization of all the bad stuff that we've had for ages. And that just makes it really easy for us to be bad. And that's how you reconstruct it. I've really appreciated this uh, combination of 
philosophy and history tonight. It's not one that I'm accustomed to. So thank you very much for this. I think, um, I think we should wrap it up for the evening. I think uh, probably a lot of us really appreciate being able to go on with this idea of thinking about the relationships between power and responsibility and irresponsibility and can really, these questions that we always have about like, well, what do we do with this knowledge or new ways of thinking? I think really to be thinking about, we're always talking about this. Where do you have power in your own life? Where are you giving other people power? And are you using it for responsibility? Are you using it responsibly? Are you asking other people to use it responsibly is maybe a good way to, to move on from this conversation. So there's some great things in the chat. I wanna make sure folks know that this is the, the kickoff and an amazing one it has been for a month long of programs. We'll be talking on April 14th about uh, Rohingya stories of hope. Uh, on the 21st, we'll be talking about tools of survival related to, to tribal sovereignty in Oregon and beyond. Uh, the Yam HaShoah reading of the names on April 28th, uh, and also many of the groups who've supported tonight's program. Uh, there's an event on April 14th looking at interrupting violence from the Holocaust to modern hate groups. Uh, so please follow all of the organizations. Links in the chat. Uh, to Jennifer's wonderful uh, introduction essay to the Chinese diaspora in Oregon, special issue of the Oregon Historical Quarterly. And Barrett, it looks like you have also a, um, a, a, a newsletter, a Substack newsletter. So you can look up Barrett Holmes Pickner and uh, Pittner, get on that newsletter for these kinds of insights every day. Just wanna say thank you uh, very much to everyone for joining us this evening. And especially thank you very much, Jennifer and Barrett for this really exciting conversation tonight. The recording will be available on the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education website. So please keep an eye out for that. And I think with that, uh, we are over for the evening. So thank you all very much. Use your power responsibly and, and wisely and have a wonderful evening. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much.